So it's wonderful to see you. Um, so let's share a brief grounding practice, and then we'll do a state check-in, followed by a teaching on mindfulness of the body. We'll fit in a little break in there somewhere, and as with each session, spend some time together with questions and conversation and finish with a dedication. So give me a Zoom or actual thumbs up if that sounds okay to y'all. Cool. <clears throat> So um, close your eyes or soften your gaze. Find, find some comfort in this place, in this moment. <clears throat> and as you settle into stillness, sense that you're pausing, arriving in presence. With a gentle attention, notice the state of your body right now. Take a full deep breath and release it slowly, feeling the sensations of the exhale as your breath moves through your chest, your throat, and your nostrils. <clears throat> now you allow your breath to return to its natural rhythm and sense that you can relax. Feel the pull of gravity and how the earth is supporting you, both holding you close and lifting you up. Bring your attention to yourself seated here and let the eyes and face be soft. Loosen the jaw. Let the shoulders relax and the arms and hands rest easily <clears throat> so you're seated with a sense of dignity and alertness. And at the same time, a deep invitation of presence and relaxation. Arriving in this moment. <clears throat> Thank you. So let's begin with a moment of social meditation, social noting specifically with what we call a state check-in. Um, those of you who introduced yourself last week, when I call the name I see on your Zoom square, please use one word or two to describe what's rising in your present moment experience using the there is form of noting. And I think we were all here last week, so we can do that. So I'll model that for you. Um, there is affection, um, anticipation, and um, settling. Andrea? There is energy, anticipation, and gratitude. Did you want me to call someone else? How about Jane? Muted Jane. I do it all the time. There is always forgetfulness, forgetfulness, extreme tiredness, and um, joy for my daughter. Yeah. Um, Anna Marie. Uh -huh. Anna, Anna Marie writes compassion. <clears throat> and Jim will be uh, joining us in, uh, in, in noble silence for a few reasons today. Thank you, thank you both. <clears throat> so we begin um, 
today with one of the most well-known quotes from the Buddha. There is one thing that when cultivated and practiced regularly leads to deep spiritual intention, to peace, to mindfulness and clear comprehension, to vision and knowledge, to a happy life here and now, and to the culmination of wisdom and suffering. And what is that one thing? Mindfulness centered on the body. So this evening we'll explore the importance of being in our bodies, uh, what happens when we leave, and how we can connect with our bodies to practice mindfulness of our embodiment. <clears throat> so at the outset, I'd like to acknowledge the sponsor of this teaching on mindful embodiment, the brain. As we begin to speak about mindful embodiment, I think it's natural to start by briefly considering how our mindfulness practices actually impact our brain. Research shows that that these practices can lead to enhanced neural functioning. That's right, mindfulness meditation changes our brains. Neuroscientist Dan Siegel in his pocket guide to interpersonal neurobiology says, in interpersonal neurobiology, the term brain is used as a shorthand reference for the neural mechanisms of the whole of the energy and information flow that moves through the extensive interconnections of the body proper and the skull-based collection of cells in the head. <clears throat> Typical Dan Siegel. Um, now that's a somewhat broader idea than I used to have about it. For short, brain is a way of referring to the embodied mechanism of the information flow in the body. And how we focus our attention specifically activates certain regions of the skull-based brain enabling us to selectively turn on certain regions, which creates the possibility of inducing structural changes in the brain. According to David Trelevin, author of Trauma-Sensitive Mindfulness, one of the better known mindfulness meditation research findings is that it correlates with thicker prefrontal areas of the brain. Meditators have greater activation in the prefrontal cortex. Given that the prefrontal cortex helps us observe our experience, and exert executive control over compulsions from the emotional brain, the relation to mindfulness makes sense, because mindfulness allows us to witness thoughts, sensations, and emotions without being identified with them. So I always feel the need to give a nod to the brain when talking about embodiment. Not every meditation engages the body. Uh, last week, I mentioned a variety of different styles and types, and, you know, it, it can be mantra meditations or meditating on a candle or loving kindness practices. In fact, there's a really common misunderstanding that in some way, meditation is all about transcending the body, you know, maybe entering into this realm of crystal rainbows of light and the formless dimensions, you know, but just sometimes maybe. And yet, it's really right at the experience of waking up, this capacity to be awake in the body. And you might ask, why is it so essential? Why do we have to be awake in the body? What makes it so important? So mindfulness of the body allows us to live fully. It brings healing, wisdom, and freedom. Our human body is precious. It provides the necessary conditions to realize true happiness. When we're present in our bodies, we discover how our body responds when our mind is clear or when it's confused, when our heart is open or, or closed. The body is always with us in this life. We get to return to it over and over, investigating the nature of reality through the body. When we're awake in the body, we are present right here and now. <clears throat> if you think of the moments in your life that were most enlivening or happy or gratifying or meaningful, maybe moments outside in nature or with someone you love or at a birth or maybe meditating, when you really touched a sense of peace, you had to be fully in your body to experience it, to, to register what was happening. 
In February of 2010, I was able to see the uh, Dalai Lama in Washington, D.C. at a Mind and Life conference. He had just come out with his book on happiness. Um, the local news, the evening of the first day, one of the news reporters that was interviewing him said, or asked him about uh, the happiest moment in his life. So he paused and he got this mischievous look he gets, you know, and he said, oh, I think now. And I love that response. If we reflect in the other direction, and if you think of the moments when you were really suffering, moments that were really difficult, when you were in a conflict with another person or experiencing fear or self-aversion, the common denominator of experiences of suffering are that we are in some way disconnected from our body, maybe even at war with our body. Pema Children writes, it's helpful to realize that this very body that we have, that's sitting here right now with its aches and its pleasures is exactly what we need to be fully human, fully awake, fully alive. One of the goals of the mindfulness practices we're cultivating is really to inhabit a full presence. And the domain of the body is the energetic substrata of every other experience, of emotions, thoughts, perceptions. They're all experienced on a physical level. Everything arises from what we touch and feel or smell or see or hear. I think most of us can embrace that idea, but after decades of practice, I can testify that often enough, it's not easy to be fully present and awake in the body. For most of us, I think, without the intention to be here and now, we leave our bodies all the time. We're actually conditioned to leave conditioning that resides in our primitive brain and in our genes. When we're stressed, upset, uncomfortable, or worrying, we want to move away from the present moment and those feelings, so we leave. And the more anxious we are, the faster we leave. Likewise, when something is pleasurable, we're conditioned to hold on to it, to grasp for more of it, which also moves us away from the aliveness of the present moment. As Tara Brock explains, our survival instinct is to control things. So to really inhabit this body, we must be willing to surrender into what feels out of control. Yet we are way more comfortable with control. And when we're controlling, we're in our minds, not in our bodies. And this creates a mind-body split. When we're in our heads, thinking and worrying about the future or stuck with regret and sadness in the past. We cannot be truly present and alive in our bodies. So we try to control things using this mental control tower perched on the top of our body. <clears throat> and as we know, that's often mediated by technology, especially the cyber world. And the more we're involved online, the more we're looking at our screens, the more dissociated we are from our bodies. I worry about my granddaughters, Grace and Isla, and our new grandson, Walker, when I allow myself that luxury. The statistics show that kids spend five to six hours a day looking at screens. It's amazing. It's a story. One mom finds her young son outside on the front steps playing a video game. And she asks, you know, what are you doing? And he says, well, you told me to go outside and play. You know, but, but think about it. This generation spends half as much time playing outside as its parents did. The body-mind split also gets exacerbated by patriarchal religions that mistrust the feminine, mistrust the body, mistrust the earth wants to dominate. And our culture fosters an identification with the body as separate, as something to be acted upon. We identify with outer appearance and we're conditioned to view our bodies as objects to be manipulated. We try to fix our bodies, to buff our bodies, to medicate our bodies. And this removes us from inhabiting our bodies. 
Philosopher John O'Donohue writes, our bodies know that they belong to life, that they belong to spirit. It's our minds that make our life so homeless. So <clears throat> what happens when we leave our bodies? We become disconnected. To push away and leave our bodies takes energy. So then there's fatigue. And then there's also anxiety about what we're not paying attention to, what we're pushing away. When we dissociate from our bodies, we often develop unhealthy escape habits. We leave our bodies by numbing with food, by obsessing, perhaps by locking into judgment. <clears throat> I remember a cartoon. There's a man and woman sitting in their living room and the woman saying, you know, if I ever turn into a vegetable, please just pull the plug. And at which point he goes over to the TV set and yanks the cord. So we get cut off. We get cut off from our heart because when we leave, we're not feeling this domain that allows us to experience warmth and tenderness and openness, the space where we feel connection. We get cut off from our belly, which is really the center of feeling authentic power, and from the pelvic region, the creativity and sensuality of our lives, our sexuality, we get cut off. <clears throat> Finally, when we're dissociated, we're living in a virtual reality. We're not getting the messages of our body's intelligence and our heart's wisdom. So instead, we're reacting to the world out of fight, flight, freeze. We're in reaction mode and often we're reacting in unwise ways. A situation well exemplified by the two hunters that are somewhere in the woods of South Jersey. And one hunter by mistake, you know, he looks around and all of a sudden he sees his friend on the ground and as it turns out his friend has had a heart attack anyway he <clears throat> he panics and he's got a signal so he dials 911 and he's like emergency emergency my friend just died what do i do <clears throat> and the woman that's speaking to him says calm down calm down first make sure he's dead and then there's a shot heard in the background and he comes back to the phone okay what next so that's a terrible example. So part one is reasons it's essential to be in our bodies. And part two is the suffering when we leave. So the third part is, and this is the domain that we're exploring now, how do we offer practices of reconnecting? Which is really what we're here to learn how to do, these practices of reconnecting. And one of the images I think is so valuable is offered by Joseph Campbell describes the circle of awareness. <clears throat> and there's a horizontal line going through the circle. And it's annotated to show that everything that's below the line is out of our conscious awareness and everything above the line is what we're aware of. And as we deepen our attention, the line moves. There's more and more in the light of awareness. And so what we're doing in our mindfulness of body practice is is including more and more in the awareness that we've habitually pushed under. And that's part of the waking up. So how do we do that? One of the first elements that we talked about last week in the session on the breath is that we have some identified or pre-identified anchor, a sensory anchor, feeling touch points in the body or feeling the breath, or it could be sound that helps us to come out of that mental control tower when we're lost in a virtual reality. Ah, come back here, come back, over and over again, come back. And a powerful question to keep asking ourselves is, what is the difference between being in any thought and being right here in this living reality? What's in between? Fueling the practices of reconnecting, there's an attitude that's really key. With all the re-entering and re-inhabiting the body, it's really essential that it's gentle, that it's slow, it's with interest and with care. Because we wouldn't be leaving if we weren't somehow afraid of what's here. 
So think about that. So both in the ways that we invite others into our present moments and we invite ourselves in, it, it really needs to be very forgiving. <clears throat> forgiving that we've left or excluded and gentle about arriving, about including. And the anchor is a very beautiful support for that. The anchor signals us when we've left. Oh, okay, gone, gone, gone come back. It gives us a way and a place to come back to. And it gives us a way to collect our scatteredness. <clears throat> One of the tools that's central to mindful embodiment is the body scan. I know you probably know lots of ways to do it. There are lots. Very often it's a meditation guided by another, but eventually a part of us can do the guiding. The key element with the body scan is this sort of systematic arriving in different parts of the body and, and without interfering, opening to the experience that's there as it is, how we encounter it without elaboration. And I've found that one of the most powerful ways of inviting my attention in the body scan is the language of feeling things from the inside out to begin by sensing what it's like. If you feel your hand right now, and you know, you rub your hands together and you feel the surfaces, the outer surfaces of your hand, you can feel the warmth, that friction fairly quickly. And then the invitation is, and you could do this right now, just hold your hand still and feeling from the inside out how much aliveness is there and becoming more and more familiar with that feeling from the inside out throughout your body. It begins to wake up, with, which is what's sometimes described as the inner body or the energy body. Psychotherapist and researcher Judith Blackstone writes that Inhabiting the body is not the same as being aware of the body. It's not a top-down experience. Inhabiting the body means that we live within our body, that we are present throughout the whole internal space of our body. <clears throat> it means we feel that we are made of consciousness everywhere in our body. So this is the direction we go to with the body scan to get more and more familiar with inhabiting, with inhabiting our body versus peering down on it or manipulating it in some way. So there's the anchor, there's the coming back, there's the scanning, all the different ways of scanning and feeling from the inside out, the movement of sensation, noticing where sensation is, noticing the different qualities of sensations so that it becomes more and more refinement and being able to name what's being experienced. And it can be very, very powerful, the naming, notation, mental notation. We call it noting at the beginning to refine that sensitivity, to be able to know burning, squeezing, twisting, heat, cool, just to be able to sense that, to really begin to ask some questions to inquire of the body, what's happening inside me? And can I be with this? Bring a real profound presence right to the body. And we begin to trust that we can be here. <clears throat> this is a poem I love from poet Dana Falls. She says, trust the energy that courses through you, trust, then take surrender even deeper. Be the energy. Don't push anything away. Follow each sensation back to its source in vastness and pure presence. Emerge so new, so fresh, that you don't know who you are. Welcome to this season of monsoons. Be the bridge across the flooded river and the surging torrent underneath. Be unafraid of consummate wonder. Be the energy 
and blaze a trail across the clear night sky like lightning. Dare to be your own illumination. What is it really like right now in here? What's going on? So in our practice later this evening, I'll invite you to inhabit your body just for a visit. And it won't be long before you're pulled back into your head, into your thinking mind. But then you can begin to practice returning, much as we practice coming back to our breath when distracted or caught up in our stories. Exactly like that. Returning to being, returning your kind and loving attention to the body. And you develop gifts of the return, the sense of being able to come back. When we dissociate, things get blocked and frozen and stuck. When we come back in, that presence, like the sun on ice, allows a kind of melting and a movement. And that movement is a sign of healing. When you pay attention closely and start sensing this constellation of dancing sensations, that's the beginning of healing, to release those blockages and, and process trauma. So it's a little early to start talking about that, but if you don't already know, you'll find that most of your issues are in the tissues. Coming back into the body allows for a visceral experience in and of the heart, which opens us up to forgiveness and compassion, the all-embracing heart. It's the, it's the portal to wisdom. Be your own illumination. I love that line. That when we come into the body, we start getting a direct insight into the very nature of reality. There's no veil of concepts. So we're seeing radical impermanence. We all have the idea that everything changes, but when we're inhabiting this body, this intensely alive energy field, everything is moving. There is no center. There's no boundary. Unless you have an idea or a thought, there's no way to find a self. So we get to get a direct realization that there's no self. There's just this amazing, mysterious dance of energy. And when we let go into that, into that internal body, it just further loosens the identification with form, with body with mind. There's just this formless presence, this living, changing world that doesn't belong to anybody. Be your own illumination. This is the gift of inhabiting with mindfulness, this body. And we get the blessing of feeling fully alive. <clears throat> Edward Galeano says, excuse me, Eduardo Galeano, he says, the church says the body is a sin. Science says the body is a machine. Advertising says the body is a business. The body says, I am a fiesta. One of the things I'm aware of when we talk about mindfulness of the body is it feels very inward. But what we're exploring also is that we're not just talking about our own bodies our earth would not be suffering the way it is if we were awake to bodies. We find the more we connect in a visceral way with the aliveness here, the more our sensitivity and perceptiveness and care widens out. So we're able to really feel what's going on in the bodies of others. And we're able to feel the struggle of other beings that like us want to live fully and don't want to be oppressed or polluted or in some other way disrespected. We sense the needs of our earth, our larger body. So it's a very powerful task in hand for ourselves and those beings we share our world with in the sense of bringing from below that line into awareness what needs to be attended to. And it's, uh, it's part of healing our world. Let's take five minutes for care, an invitation to stand and stretch, quick walk, grab a beverage, whatever, and I'll ring the bell to bring us back.
for practice. So let's set an intention to sit for 10 minutes for the basic mindfulness practice with breath and body. Finding a sitting position that allows you to be alert, the spine erect but not stiff, and also relax, or any position that works for you. Kindly. Open your attention, starting exactly where you are in the midst of it all. Gently note your surroundings with your senses. <clears throat> Closing your eyes, establishing a simple sense of presence. Now, allowing your awareness to scan through your body and wherever possible, softening and releasing obvious areas of physical tension. You might take a few very full cleansing breaths and then allow your breath to be natural. Notice how the breath breathes itself. Bringing your attention to where you most easily detect the breath or perhaps where it's most pleasurable, letting this place of experiencing the breath be your home base, an anchor to the present moment. Noticing this breath right here. If the breath is not a good home base for you, you might instead anchor your attention in the 
sensations in your hands or the sensations of your whole body sitting here. So I invite you to choose your anchor for this meditation now. Now with a relaxed, interested attention, discovering what the sensations of the breath or your chosen anchor feel like moment to moment. Where is your attention now? Each time you notice that your mind has wandered off is a, a moment of mindfulness. Gently bringing your attention back to the inflow and outflow of the breath or your chosen anchor, offering a relaxed, wakeful presence. Now scanning your body and noticing if any particular sensations are strong and calling your attention. If so, allowing the breath or your home base to sort of recede to the background and bringing an interested kind presence to the sensations. <clears throat> what do they feel like? You might be aware of heat or chills, tingling, aching, twisting, stabbing, vibrating. With a soft, open awareness, feeling the sensations as they are, noticing, are they pleasant or unpleasant? As you fully attend to them, do they become more intense or do they dissipate? Noticing how they change. When the sensations are no longer a strong experience, returning to mindfulness of breathing or your chosen anchor. Returning is the key. Return to the breath or to the chosen anchor. A thousand times, it's like training a puppy. If you find it difficult to stay with strong sensations, you might breathe with them, letting the breath help you find some balance and openness in the midst. It can also be helpful to name the sensations, seeing if there's a word that describes your experience. Tightness, ache, <clears throat> heat, pressure. There's no need to strain or to run a, through a mental thesaurus to find just the right word. Notice what word arises in awareness and, and mentally repeat it to yourself in a soft tone, letting the naming be soft in the background, maybe 5% of your attention with 95% on the actual experience.
and you might ask yourself, <clears throat> what is happening inside me right now? Noticing any sensations that are predominant. And then ask, can I be with this? Directly feeling the flow of sensation, subtle or strong. Letting life be just as it is. Now, returning to your home base, the breath or anchor of particular sensations, offering a calm, steady attention. If during this last minute or so, strong sensations call your attention, letting your primary anchor recede and bringing the full attention again to what's arising. Naming what you notice, offering your presence, if nothing strong is calling your attention, continuing to rest with your home base, relax and alert. Sensing the breath in the foreground, still aware of the field of sensations in the background. You are learning to be centered, balanced, and present for the breath and the living world of sensation. Becoming wisely aware of this changing life. So next Tuesday, we'll navigate the slider up or out the four foundations of mindfulness that the historical Buddha taught about in the Satipatthana Sutra. From mindfulness of the body to mindfulness of feelings. And as the mind encountered body, uh, bodily energies, mindfulness of emotion. <clears throat> And we'll do for each of our course meetings, let's uh, go ahead and take the last few minutes that we have for qu any questions or comments you might have for me or the rest of the community. And feel free to raise your Zoom hand, your real hand, or just open your microphone and speak. We don't have any burning questions or, or comments. Why don't we take five of the next minutes for a nice silent sit to, to practice a mindfulness of the body. Sound okay? 
be nice to sit together in silence. when our mind decides to take us on a little wandering, the breath as our anchor will help us come back to our mindfulness of the body.
breath in the body, always in the present moment, always available to call us back to the present moment when we find ourselves time traveling. So, <clears throat> are there any burning questions or comments before before we do our dedication? Here's what I found. No, Alexa, you're not included. <clears throat> I just want to say thank you for the lovely practice, Michael. Thank you all for making it lovely. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and put our palms together. Let us dedicate all the value accrued through prayer, contemplation, meditation, and practice for the benefit of all beings and to the incomparable expanse of totality. Good night, friends. See you soon. <clears throat>